You are listening to SPN, the Sports Podcasting Network. Welcome to Scuderia F1, the podcast that's always up to speed with the latest Formula One news. Follow us on Twitter at Scuderia F1 Pod and subscribe to the show on iTunes and Stitcher. Now, here are your hosts, Mark Daly and Kevin Laramay. And welcome to Scuderia F1, Kevin Arme with Mark Daly as always. Mark, I'm back from vacation better than ever and Formula One has come back as well. Summer break and now we're back. We're back in the thick of things. Not only with Italy and Monza done heading into Singapore, but now a lot of behind the scenes tractations are maybe coming to an end. And I think that's where we need to start this show, Mark, is, well, McLaren and Honda, it might be over after all. Isn't that funny? We were just remarking before we started doing the show that the silly season for the drivers was not really as silly as usual. In fact, there wasn't really anything to talk about because Ferrari didn't make any changes, uh, Red Bull didn't make any changes, and it's still status quo Mercedes, and who really cares about the rest? But <laughs> <Pretty> much, <laughs> anyways, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's uh, all the joking. same anyways. Nobody's even close to the performance of all the other cars, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> exactly right but it's it's been very interesting uh, like you say the long rumored divorce between McLaren and Honda is uh, apparently going to be a thing sooner rather than later it seems to be a bit of an open secret in the the formula 1 paddock at the moment and i guess it really was kind of hinted to over the this past weekend what with news that part of the sweetener for the for the pot for Renault is to get uh Carlos Sainz for a, a loan basically for one year for 2018 but that actually could be moved up as early as the Malaysian Grand Prix in a week or two's time if they can manage to sort out something and basically give poor Julian Palmer a, a <laughs> boot, boot out the back door yeah <laughs> my Julian oh, that, the big loser would be Julian Palmer but uh, if you go back a few races ago, Carlos Sainz and uh, Daniel Kvyat had a, a few rubbing of wheels on the on the yes. track, and now it's not that surprising now that you know what? L- let's stop that tension, Carlos. See you later. Bye bye. Adios. Go to Renault for a few years, and uh, maybe Carlos Sainz and Nico Hulkenberg together can uh, get better performance out of the car we'll see the car is getting better and uh, they're hopeful the car is going to be good in Singapore uh, but if you're looking at Carlos Sainz move to Renault is it a forward move like in his career long term depending of maybe being to with Renault now maybe McLaren Renault down the road who knows it is I think a sideways move as of now though looking at the performance of the car especially if it happens in a few weeks time you're looking at the same type of level car that he would have driven anyways well i'm to be quite honest kevin i'm a little bit um sitting on the fence with this one uh in terms of whether it's a, a lateral move or not because of course this year is the first proper renault badged car because last year was basically a, a caterham or a lotus i should say with a, with a renault badge on it so they definitely have progressed forward but the big thing is going to be how much are they going to progress forward for 2018 and if they're still the same spot and competing in the midfield like they are this year uh, compared to to next year, then of course it'll be a lateral move because they basically said when they bought Lotus at the end of 2015 that it was basically a short, well, I'd say a mid to long term program that they wanted to be be back at the top of Formula One by the, in what was it, five years or something like that. I so basically... So, yeah. Yeah, we're basically halfway through that period now because, as you mentioned off the top here, we're we're just back from the summer break. So we're basically two and a half years into this thing now. So where they're going to go in the next couple of years is going to be uh, very interesting. But I think that for me, I was quite surprised that they managed to arrange this whole deal to have uh, Carlos Sainz because how many hundreds of miles did uh, Robert Kubica put in that car over the various test sessions over the summer because that kind of seemed like that was going to be the more likely move was maybe to 
punt out poor Julian Palmer in favor of uh, Robert Kubica, of course, who hasn't driven a Formula One car in a number of years after he had that horrible uh, rally uh, accident that basically almost amputated his arm. Anyways, he proved that uh, he still got the speed and the stamina and the strength to drive a Formula One car. So Science to Renault for me is a very interesting move, and it's probably as political and kind of a, like I said, a deal sweetener as anything else. And I guess we can maybe start the hashtag McLaren Watch or you know, <laughs> TikTok Bye Bye Renault Honda Watch. or something like that, Renault Watch, something like that, because it seems and like it's just a matter of time now before the deal's done, right? It'll be interesting too what name it takes, because if you're looking at Red Bull, the Renault aspect is branded tag, right? Yes, so, yeah, that's uh, correct. Yeah, can you bring back from the past Mega Chrome? So c- c- could you call McLaren Mega Chrome? That would be nice. That has a nice <laughs> ring to it. Well, it's it's interesting because that was part of the deal that uh, that Red Bull had was uh, that they'd have the Renault engine, but they were basically free to brand it in whatever they wanted. So, I mean, it isn't a Red Bull, uh, sorry, Red Bull Renault. It is actually Red Bull, Red Bull Tag Heuer. So, I mean, it's uh, underneath the badge. It's all completely the same. But I, I think what's really interesting about the whole situation is just the, all the dominoes that are lining up at the moment. You've got science going to Renault and Renault only have these uh, three sets of of engines or three teams that they're supplying themselves, which is the works team, uh, Toro Rosso and Red Bull. And they said that they were not going to issue another or make another set of customer engines available. And of course, uh, if Honda is going to leave McLaren or McLaren is going to leave Honda, depending from your point of view, then that is the, the, the only likely scenario that they would get Renault engines if they're, they're going to come from one team or another. And obviously out of that, that trio of Renault, Red Bull and Toro Rosso, well, it's, it's pretty obvious <laughs> which is the, the to- low man on the totem pole. Which Toro would basically- Rosso Honda? Yeah, well, that's basically the thing. So basically, they're swapping Science to Renault and Honda, and and uh, and Renault would switch engines in the two teams that they're supplying now. But it, it was very interesting, just the way that it's kind of been going down, and the the news that it's been coming out over the past week or so. And Jean Tote, the uh, the president of the FIA, and other people uh, higher ups in uh, in Formula One say it's of utmost importance to keep Honda in Formula One. And of course, what with that uh, deal falling through with Sauber earlier in the year after uh, uh, Monisha Keltenborn left as team principal of, uh, of Sauber, then that fell through. Obviously, the big deal there was that they couldn't secure a gearbox supply and Sauber not developing their own gearbox. Well, what, what, what use is an engine <laughs> if you don't have a gearbox to strap it to? So that, that kind of made sense. But it's just very... I guess very Formula One, the way that everything's working out. But I guess that's about the only way I can kind of sum it up. It's it's just a very Formula One situation. And in the same vein, Pierre Gasly, the Frenchman that actually drives in Formula Two now, has been confirmed. He's in the frame to make his Formula One debut if everything falls into place for the Malaysian Grand Prix as soon as next weekend. If the deal comes through... And Julian Palmer gets the boost. Carlos Sainz moves to Renault. You need a driver for Toro Rosso, and Pierre Gasly would be that driver. Well, it's kind of uh, fitting, I think, as well, that you have a young, talented driver like Pierre Gasly joining uh, Toro Rosso because that is kind of their their whole mantra, their whole raison d'être, is to ha- develop these young drivers and uh, hopefully move them up to the, the the big main Red Bull team, assuming they stick around in uh, Formula One for the long term. But that's a completely different discussion for a completely different year or different day. But I mean, that's where we've seen guys like Sebastian Vettel and Danny Ricardo and Max Verstappen, who obviously didn't last very long with Toro Rosso before moving up to the uh, the, the main Red Bull team. So it'll be interesting to, to see whether Gasly comes in at uh, Malaysia or not. And again, it's uh, dependent on a number of things and a number of dominoes falling, but uh, it would be kind of cool. And th- again, it really goes to show that the that the trend in Formula One is to move towards these uh, younger drivers. I mean, we were just talking about uh, Robert Kubica a couple of minutes ago. I mean, he's obviously uh, getting up there a little bit in age. I mean, he's not terribly old, but uh, I mean, Gasly is obviously a, well, a young, very promising driver, age. right? Sorry, Mike, I was just going to say, it's not the age of Robert Kubica. Mm-hmm. It's the lack of continuity. It changed so much in a few years, and if you haven't been part of the whole changes, yeah, it's hard to maybe be there at the same level for a long period of time. If you're looking at Alonso and Jensen Button or 
other quote unquote older drivers. It's not the age the problem. It's when you take a big break and you come back, it, it, things have changed, and especially the time that Robert Kubica has been away from Formula One, it evolved Which so is much. What? That Seven it years, problem. I think so. So I think something like that, yeah. right? Twenty ten, twenty eleven yeah. is the last year. So it's not seven years, and it evolved so much. Talking about like there were no hybrid system back then, and all, oh, and that's just one small little thing that is present now that wasn't then. So it changed so much that mm-hmm. it's not just the age factor; it's unknown. It's the performances are unknown, and you're better. You're better if you're a Renault with a known commodity. And that's Carlos Sainz, which he's a proven driver in the past when he had a performance car. So if the performance are there, maybe Carlos Sainz is a good partner with Nico Hulkenberg. Yeah, it'll be fascinating to watch to see what uh, Carlos uh, could do with it. But uh, I was just also thinking, too, that you were just saying just how that that whole issue of continuity. Just look at how much uh, Jensen Button was off the pace when he deputized for uh, Alonso back at Monaco a couple of months ago. And I mean, he really hadn't missed all that much time when you think about it. I mean, he only raced his final Grand Prix at Abu Dhabi last November. So when you really think about it, he was only out of the sport for, what, six, eight months? I mean, obviously, he missed all the preseason testing and the new cars and uh, the the benefit of uh, racing in the first half half dozen races or whatever. But I mean, I mean, he qualified fairly decently. But when it came to the race itself, I mean, he was well off the pace. And unfortunately, the only thing we'll remember about Jensen at Monaco 2017 is when he punted unfortunate <laughs> Pascal <laughs> Berline sideways. Into the <laughs> sideways. Yeah. Tackled, unfortunately, yeah. He tackled him. It would have been a great move in a football match, but not so good for Formula One. Yeah, exactly. It? It's like a slide tackle with the cleats up, you know. Yeah. Hey, so let's uh, talk a little bit now about uh, Sauber. Did you hear the news that uh, they are actually looking to hire an additional 100 staff, which I think is a a, a resume? Yeah, no kidding, right? I think this is great news because, I mean, they have been wallowing at the back of the pack for the past couple of years. And there was a lot of uncertainty around the team. And when I heard that that whole issue with the Honda engines was not going to happen and then Kaltenborn left the team, I was kind of really worried that maybe... Sauber in their 25th year in Formula One was kind of maybe on life support like we've well, seen some was. other teams. <laughs> it, it was, was yeah. Year. And the new owner, like you mentioned, Vassar, is going to hire about 100 people. And that's a lot. You're talking about yes. big employee, big teams like Renault that are getting close to 400 now and they still want to be bigger. Uh, but mm-hmm. if you're looking at Sauber 100 plus, you're like adding a third or a quarter more of your workforce that you already have. And that's going to be a lot of help that they desperately needed in a lot of different factors and hopefully in the factory. And and I talk about factory, it's a big, big factor now, especially that their their partnership with Ferrari is supposed to be a bit more uh, involved where Ferrari will have a bit more say and have the drivetrain and the Ferrari engine and a more updated version and, and be able to have better performance out of it. So technically, if they better up their aerodynamic department, they should have a decent car next year if they can get the same spec engine as Ferrari, which could be the case for next year. Yeah, well, we know the issues that they have with the Ferrari engine this year. Obviously, it's a, a 2016 spec engine, which does not really... <laughs> uh, Doesn't how, fit how the big say? tires. It does, yeah, it... it yeah, it literally doesn't. I mean, it, it is not a car or an engine that is designed for these cars. And I mean, they're they're suffering for it. So, and obviously this year's Ferrari engine is uh, is very good. I mean, it still lacks obviously in some straight line speed compared to the Mercedes. I mean, we saw that at, uh, at Monza between Ferrari and Mercedes. When you look at uh, at Vettel and, and Botas and Hamilton and how those, the, the silver hours literally just disappeared down the track. But anyways, I mean, for Sauber, that would be a huge step forward. And of course, that straight line speed is something that they're lacking now, but also getting those additional people in the, into the into the company, into the team to help in the area and with the aerodynamics and, and stuff like that. That's where they're going to make their their improvements. Is you know they've got the power, they got the speed, but it's taking that speed from from the straights and into the corners and getting a car that handles uh, better and punches a, a better, more efficient uh, hole through the air. And hopefully that means uh, an improvement in lap times, which will translate into higher positions uh, qu- in qualifying and also in races and hopefully more points for the team. So I, th- I think that's great news. No, I think next year I would put McLaren and Sauber maybe on equ- equal footing starting the year because both of them should have technically a better engine than they have right now. 
mm-hmm. McLaren with the fact that it would have a Renault engine, maybe spec engine as uh, Red Bull, or maybe just a bit below, but close, right? So maybe you have a, a, a high performance engine for McLaren, and if you are uh, Sauber with Ferrari partnership with a better drivetrain, better gearbox and engine altogether, maybe better with mixed with better aerodynamics and a bigger team. I would put them maybe at least not back at the pack and maybe back where they belong, which McLaren would be a top five team and Sauber closer to sixth than tenth. Yeah, I mean, it would be great for for both teams. But did you hear the news uh, last week? There was uh, some talk that, uh, well, of course, obviously, uh, Porsche is talking about coming into to F1, which is kind of yeah, in seems it might happen. 2021, 2020, something like that. Something like that. But the the other news that's uh, coming out, so sort of percolating up through the background noise about that time frame as well, is that McLaren would uh, would actually think about building their own engines in uh, post-2020 when the current set of regulations expire, depending on what the next generation of Formula One engines uh, are, are going to take. That, of course, is still debate, under debate and hasn't been decided yet. But uh, Zach Brown did mention that. And that would be kind of a cool thing. I mean, obviously, you have Mercedes and Ferrari that are basically building everything from, from front to back, including the engine. So could McLaren possibly do that? I mean, it would be a, a first for them, obviously. But I mean, they, they do have some of the know-how because they do have their own road cars yeah, well, and whether that's where i was going mark they have a production line mm-hmm. they actually uh the engine at uh, the the factory in uh well i don't know i don't remember what it's in england anyways in the factory uh, they produce their own cars and the big project the mclaren one is due to come out soon and uh, you're going to need new job to the designing team everything mm-hmm. that's surrounding the design and the the build-up to that project is going to come to an end and you'll need job for those people maybe building f1 engine is the project that will take place at that factory at that point and also um, mercedes has just released their new uh, formula one hypercar supercar whatever you want to call it and it looks uh, pretty spectacular i saw some of the the the, the pictures earlier today but i actually haven't uh, had a chance to, to read up on it but yeah like you say i mean that would make a, a lot of sense to take all those people and to 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 reapply them somewhere else and who knows it uh, it could happen but other interesting news in the Formula One world, and this one kind of took me back a little bit, is uh, that F1 commercial chief Sean Bratch has said that they've had up to 40 groups or venues from around the world since Liberty Media took over as the new owners of Formula One last year. 40, that is an impressive number. And they didn't really say where or who exactly. So that is... Uh, Obviously, the the source of uh, much uh, speculation, but he's uh, been talking about that they want to split the season by races, or sorry, by region, and have races in Europe and Asia and the uh, the Americas grouped together. And w- that was something that we talked about, I think, last winter when uh, when Ross Braun mentioned something similar because he, I think he, what did he want? Something like a twenty five race season or something like something that. Like that group by yeah. race by by groups of five, where you would have two stints in Europe. Uh, mm-hmm. One of them intersected by the like North American stint where we have like Montreal and then a possibly a race in the region of Toronto. Then you have mm-hmm. Austin and probably one in the New York area and probably one in the West Coast, Long Beach or something. Uh, that interest. But I, I wouldn't be surprised if, if a lot of big names from the past. You know the famous idea I have of an actual world tour of Formula One where you actually yep. go to old old tracks and old races and some of them new but some of them old and an actual like worldwide tour and that's what it's going to become I believe with like you say a few different stops around the way and maybe breaks of a month or two here and there and maybe the season takes part in not a calendar year per se but intersected by different breaks and you find a way to make it all work and you have like australia to start you know what i mean you start in australia you have maybe your singapore race close to it because it's that time of year it could be okay there you know and one anyways how you figure it out like five stops and the entire whatever but i think that's where we're going to go and i wouldn't be surprised uh if we see names of the past come back in this championship like long beach is one that i think Formula One wants to go back, and if you're looking at Formula One and their co- the competition in the world of open wheel, 
it's a lot of street racing. And I wouldn't be surprised if Formula One adds a street circuit here and there in Long Beach. I wouldn't be surprised at all if it's one of them. Yeah, and it's kind of interesting too the way that you look at the 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 schedule right now. I mean, you do have it's kind of sort of broken up into region as it is. <clears throat> Excuse me, sort of, and I, I I use that loosely because you have the first three races of the year, like you did this year. You had Australia, China, and Bahrain. Then they moved to Europe, starting with uh, Russia. Then you had uh, several races there, but you have uh, yeah, we'll say Russia, Spain, Monaco, Canada, Azerbaijan, Austria. Britain and then Hungary and then you have the, the the summer break. So I mean they're they're hopping around. I mean, and yeah, Canada's out it, of nowhere, of course. Yeah, it always. is. It's it's yeah. <laughs> it's just kind of funny because uh, you know you go to Monaco, then you come to Canada, then you go all the way back to Europe again. So it would make a, a little bit more more sense to group them up if that uh, that was possible and of course uh, it would make a lot of sense to do that like you say if they do expand up to 25 uh, races or more in the future whatever whatever it might uh, might take and that would be the only way to do it because kind of flying around and back and forth and stuff like that you're going to have to have a lot of back-to-back weekends and we're going to have what the the, the first back-to-back-to-back uh, race weekends in formula one next year what is it like britain germany and then the french grand prix or something like that or hungary i think it's basically three weeks all in a row but you can do that in that uh, that situation because obviously those uh, three countries are, are fairly close to one another and the venues aren't that uh, really that far apart in in i guess uh as far as the crow flies so uh, that that would be an interesting test to at least see how that works uh, i mean obviously this could be a lot of work for the people that have to move around to the different venues and rebuild those cars and and get them running each and every weekend but for the fans it's a it's a great thing yeah, speaking of the future of formula 1 mark as well uh force india coo omar shafnaur Force India, probably going to be Force One in the future, we'll see, uh, believes that $150 million could be like the, the good cap if there's such thing in the future to maybe uh, assure parity across the board. $150 million would be maybe a figure that could be worked with where if you keep the cost down in the engine department, $150 million is plenty to build a decent team. Do salary caps work though? That's a, always yeah. seems to be the. You convince, can you ever convince Ferrari, Mercedes, <laughs> McLaren, and Williams to maybe the big spenders? Yeah, yeah, the big spenders. And uh, can you convince them? No, exactly. And guess what? They have a lot of votes on the board. So yeah, I'll never fly. But if such thing exists, the CEO believe uh, 150 million could be a good number. Well, I mean, it seems like a hell of a lot of money to to somebody like you or me, but uh, I'll, to, take just, <laughs> I'll take a percent of that. Well, it, it, exactly. I, I'd be interested right now to find out what uh, what Force India's uh, budget is at the moment. If uh, 150 million is more or less, I mean, obviously the big teams like Ferrari uh, and Mercedes are spending know, right? much, much. Pardon me. I don't know. It's a good. It's a good question. Yep. How much do it, they have to pay to get those engines? That's what I'm thinking. Well, that's the other thing too, is that they're they're talking in the long term that engine costs may actually uh, go down, so th- it won't be such a, a huge uh, portion of a team's budget. Which I can't remember. I, I believe that Total Wolf said that it would. I think that uh, customer engines could go down to something between the five to eight percent of a team's overall budget, which seems amazing to think. Okay, well, if it's only um, you know a customer engine deal is only five percent of your over, or eight percent of your overall budget, where is the the other ninety two or ninety five percent of the budget going to? Obviously, the drivers are going to be a big portion of that, and and uh, all the brass at the team. You've got R and D costs, personnel costs. Uh, you know the people that uh, design and build and maintain the cars. Then you've got all the transportation costs, but um, it logistics, would be yeah, all the logistics, logistics yeah. yeah, all the. Uh, the actual workforce too, the people that pack stuff, travel stuff, and that's a, it's a big enterprise. It's actually very interesting behind the scenes how amazing, logistically speaking, Formula One is, and it's actually very efficient as well. So, uh, though that always fascinates me when you're watching Sky Sports at the end and you actually see mm-hmm. the mechanics pack everything and everything fits tightly and everything, it's it's kind of fascinating. 
Well, it's cool too because uh, it doesn't matter if you're watching a race in China or in Great Britain or Mexico it looks the or same. wherever. Be the 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 garage looks exactly the same. Except Montreal, it's, it's pretty Except cool. Montreal, well, it, Montreal, yeah. Well, when is the the new uh, the, the the new pit supposed to be constructed and, and open for Montreal? Is it 2020? Probably. Uh, probably. Like yeah, it's a couple years down the road, but but Montreal is the 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 exception, and I think wasn't that part of the the deal to kind of keep uh, the Grand Prix in Montreal long term was to upgrade the the entire pit facility. It's or is always that... the deal, but yeah, Montreal was late in the delivery of the last deal for that, so they had to like renegotiate a new deal, and now it's the case where they're going to start building in the next few years the renovation of the paddock area. Yeah, well, it seems like a very Canadian thing. It seems that we always kind of drag our heels and then eventually get to get to doing it <laughs> sometime after everybody else is already taken When we really care have no it. choice, you're like, okay, fine, we'll do it. <laughs> okay, fine, we'll do it. <laughs> I'll get around to it. Okay, finally, I'm going to do it now. <laughs> Interesting. So why don't we talk and look ahead now to the race this weekend. And Mercedes is saying flat out that they're expecting a very difficult weekend in Singapore. Uh, and- I don't believe them. Well, yeah, that that's the thing, right? And after we saw how close Vettel hung on to the back of Hamilton around Spa, everybody was expecting that uh, that that Monza was going to be a, a really competitive race until they actually got serious and the lights turned green and everyone was like, oh, right, Mercedes has all that uh, straight line speed advantage and they've won here the last several years. But last year I thought was interesting at uh, Singapore. Nico Rosberg won the race, but he only beat Danny Ricardo, who put on a, quite a charge in the last, last of what was it, about 10 or 15 laps, whatever it was, and only held him off by half a second at, uh, at the end. But it, it is true, it is not typically... A track that they have done well at. Um, Sebastian Vettel has uh, won the race there four times. He he won it three times in uh, in a row, but that was with uh, with Red Bull. Won it two years ago for Ferrari, which was 2015. Was that the only race that they won that year? Could have been. I believe so. Yes. Yeah, but uh, but yeah. So Ferrari could be. Maybe this is the race where they could do a little bit better. Eh, So we'll see. I still don't believe it. Until they show otherwise, yeah, the Silver Arrows are the favorite in my mind every time around. Yeah, not just because of recent history, but because I believe their engine and their car is actually better than the Ferrari majority, if not all the time. It's just about fine tuning, and they have been able to found to find that sweet spot lately. So I wouldn't be surprised if this is all just smoke and mirror. It could be because when you look at uh, even the last couple of races before the summer break, the the indications that Mercedes had really figured it out, even as far back as uh, as Canada, because they had that disastrous race that well, not just the race, but the entire weekend at Monaco, and they really got it turned around for Canada. But then Ferrari did manage to get a couple of results after that as well. So it wasn't like it was all Mercedes after that. But the British Grand Prix, I thought, was uh, was an interesting one. And then you had the Hungarian Grand Prix, which was obviously a good situation for Ferrari because they qualified very well and they managed to get their cars out front. And that's basically all you need to do is just lead into the first quarter and hope you don't have a puncture or, or some sort of me- mechanical problem. And Sebastian Vettel was just able to stay there, even though he had that uh, problem with his, uh, with his steering. But Spa was uh, was interesting in the fact that uh, that Hamilton and Vettel were so close, but uh, again, just uh, the other weekend at Monza, it really had that feeling that that Mercedes has got this thing figured out. And I'm totally with you. Until Ferrari prove otherwise, I think that uh, it's advantage Mercedes for the rest of the way. And this will be a crucial weekend, I think, to the championship because depending how Mercedes do at Singapore, at uh, the Marina Bay Circuit, I think will be a good indication to what we can expect for the rest of the year. Because if they can come out and 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 beat Ferrari one on one on a track that they really haven't done well at over the past couple of years, that uh, it, it it could be ominous if you're a Ferrari fan, or maybe it'll still kind of leave things up in the air for a, another week or two until we get to Malaysia. Yeah, no, exactly. So I still believe. Lewis Hamilton will find a way to win. So that's my prediction until it's not the case anymore. What I mean is until either I don't I lose that confidence that the car is reliable enough that I have right now that I didn't mm-hmm. get a season. 
It's like I I would bet on Lewis Hamilton right now to win any race, any circumstances, because the probability of my mind of him winning every race is higher than fifty percent, and every single time around, just because of his performances there mixed with the car being as performance as is it has been and reliable lately. So yeah, I do feel this is maybe just to muddy the waters a little bit and maybe lower the expectation, but still at the end of the day, it might not be by five seconds. But if you win by five tenths of a second, you still win. Yeah, exactly. All you have to do is just finish in front of the other guy and it doesn't really matter if you beat him by one second or half a minute. All you have to do is finish in front of him. <laughs> That's the all that really matters. words of Vince Toretto. It doesn't matter if you win by an inch or by a mile. Still win. <laughs> it's a, it, it, Truer words have never been spoken, but it, uh, it, I don't know. I, I think that Vettel needs to get a little bit kind of angry because... Uh, he just seems like, a, I mean, he's obviously in in a good space after last year was uh, not a good year for Ferrari, but uh, he seems almost at times that, especially after that wheel-banging incident with uh, with Lewis Hamilton at uh, Azerbaijan uh, earlier this summer, that uh, he's almost been too nice <laughs> since then. <laughs> well, I mean, you've kind of had he like... He seven... went through some anger management courses. Well, he must have done. Because <laughs> he was a little bit... He was becoming angry at some point last year and, be- and earlier this year as well, on the radio, especially during races. Oh, yeah. But now maybe after some anger management courses, he decided to calm himself down and uh, try to get the <laughs> most out of his car. And I think that's the biggest difference, too. Ferrari has been having good results on many different tracks this year. Uh, but it's not always due to uh, the track suiting them. It, it's sometimes just because... In a computer term, I don't know if you can understand me, but it's like they're overclocked their cars. And sometimes Mm -hmm. it works, and sometimes the car becomes even better than they anticipated. And I think this happened a few times this year. And you try to replicate the same thing, and you're trying to push the cars to a limit. And yes, it's reliable. Ferrari has been reliable. That's not the problem. Uh, But it's more difficult to replicate a fast car when you're pushing your car to the absolute limit of it all the time. When for the Silver Arrows... They go 95% and it's enough to beat everybody else. And that's, I think, it's a big difference where the Silver Arrows can dial it down, beat everybody else. And if somebody comes close to beat them, they can dial it up and they still have a, a space to maneuver. That That's a great point that you raised because after Monza, Sergio Marchionne, the president of uh, Ferrari, said that they really didn't understand what the problem was and why that they were so far off of the pace compared to Mercedes. And you compare that and juxtapose that with what Toto Wolff was saying, that he believes one of the strengths that that Mercedes has as a team, that they're able to identify uh, weaknesses and a- areas that they need to improve on, and then they're able to to make those adjustments and and better the car and and then just get the speed and the re- reliability, whatever it might be. So that that's a, that's that's a great point that uh, you raise, and that's uh, completely echoed by the the, the powers that be. But I th- I found that an interesting admission by Marchionne after the Italian Grand Prix that you would think that if anybody would know how to get the most out of a car at Monza, you would just assume that for Ferrari would have that know-how, but uh, apparently they just couldn't get it the way that they needed it to, needed the car to be. To me, his comments mean as well that, you know what, we did everything we think we needed to do to make this car as fast as possible, and it didn't work, or at least it worked, but the other cars were still faster. You know, there's such a thing as, you know what, the other team is better than me. Mm-hmm. Not necessarily in this case, it's the team that's better, but the car might just be that damn good. The Silver Arrow car might just be that damn well put together. And even if you're Ferrari, you're doing your best, all your know-how, and you're supposed to be really fast. At the end of the day, you might just not be fast enough. Yeah, well, if you go back a couple of months ago to when Mercedes weren't really performing like we expect them to do the talk then was not so much oh we're having problems with the handling we're having problems with the engine it was they, they were having they were just having that just trying to figure out where that sweet spot was to get that car set up properly because the issues that they were having 
was being able to get the front tires and the rear tires working together in yeah, that temperature. optimal temperature range. And you, you'd either have the front tires in that optimal uh, temperature range, but not the rears and vice versa. And that really, really cost them, especially at a track like uh, Monaco, where grip is so important. And, and you it's such a tight and slow and technical circuit that you need your car to handle as best as it can. You know, you need all your components from from front to end working together in conjunction with one another and that's the problem they that they had and like total wolf said they he the strength of that team is that they're able to identify the problems and overcome them and and since then they really turned their season around because that that was a benchmark moment for them because after that they they've been pretty strong i mean there haven't been too many off weekends for mercedes since uh, monaco no no you yeah, absolutely they've been rolling slowly but surely and we don't necessarily talk about now Valtteri Bottas being a contender for the championship. No, it's all hands on deck for yeah. Lewis. It's Lewis as the main driver. Not necessarily one and two, but his position in the standings dictate that he gathers the most amount of points available each weekend. And if that means a driver swap on the track, well, that's go- what's going to be. Yeah. Well, despite uh, Botas getting to second place at the Italian Grand Prix, he didn't have a great weekend or a great race, at least at uh, at Belgium previously. So, yeah, as much as it uh, seems kind of crazy to think that maybe his title challenge is over, I mean, he's not really that far behind Sebastian Vettel. I mean, he's got 197 points. Vettel has 235 and uh, and Hamilton has 238 but you saw like last year when when Lewis was what 43 points behind 44 points by Nico Rosberg at one point i mean that took him a long time to make that uh, that that's that gap up and in, in fairness the only a guy like Lewis Hamilton uh, can, can make up a gap like that and and he did it with, at the end that's his thing yeah, I mean, it took him right to the very end it. of the season. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, he came as close as he could without winning the, the have, entire championship, right? He might have pushed his car too much throughout the season and cost him too many penalties in the grid. To the end of the day, cost him few results that cost him a championship last year. Yeah, and only by a, a very small mar- margin. What was it, like four or five points? I mean, Something like <laughs> not that. Not really a lot. It, it yeah. seems like it's a lifetime ago already. Yeah, well, I mean, when you look at it, uh, where he really lost the championship was when his engine blew up at uh, Malaysia because he was out in front. Rosberg wasn't challenging in, uh, for, for that one, and uh, Ricardo ended up uh, winning that race. But that's uh, Formula One, I suppose. But I was going to say, before we wrap it up here, I guess there, there there's no point in really making a prediction for this weekend because you've already basically <laughs> yeah. flat out said that until yeah. Ferrari can can prove otherwise that it's uh, it's Lewis Hamilton and oh but 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 before we do wrap it up I just wanted to make uh, one uh, final point about uh, Valtteri Bottas considering everything that else is that that that's happened in Formula One and considering what he's done at the team this year I mean it's got to be almost a foregone conclusion now that they're going to pick up his option for 2018 do you do you agree with yes, that I agree with it but the fact that they haven't announced yet is a statement in itself the lack of announcement might have been I don't know. Is it indicative of maybe they want somebody that could push Lewis more? Or do they want somebody that can just be with Lewis? Maybe they're still disappointed yeah. with the result he had earlier this year. Maybe they wanted somebody that would be always second to Lewis first, but always there to gather the most amount of points for the Constructor Championship because it is important for Mercedes the Constructor Championship. So I don't know. The fact that they haven't announced yet quite late in the season it might just be a foregone conclusion behind the scenes that we don't know. But the mm-hmm. fact that we don't know and it's not announced yet, I think, is a statement in itself. Yeah, considering all the other top teams have confirmed their driver lineups for, for next year. And, um, well, I mean, maybe uh, everybody's McLaren waiting. is still... Yeah, yeah, maybe, Mark, everybody's waiting for the Carlos Sainz thing. And once mm-hmm. that maybe gets announced, maybe the rest of the dominoes fall into place or something. Perhaps, but it was uh, funny just uh, when, when you were talking about... Uh, the, the the kind of guy that they want to come maybe stick with Lewis and uh, push him a little bit and still get the maximum amount of points. It's like I was thinking to myself. So basically, their ideal driver is somebody who's not Valtteri Bottas and somebody who's not Nico Rosberg, who's going to <laughs> basically fight with Lewis Hamilton. They want somebody that's basically a hybrid of both. Someone halfway between Valtteri Bottas and Nico Rosberg. That's basically What's what Rubens you want. What's Rubens Barrichello doing? 
<laughs> well, Rubens was the ideal guy when uh, when he was with uh, Michael Schumacher. Or Eddie Irvine. Or Eddie, Eddie Irvine, Irvine. Went to pass. Like, <laughs> what? You need me to run into the guy so he doesn't finish? No problem. Done, boss. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So Eddie Irvine or Rubens Barrichello is our our, our pick for that second seat at uh, Mercedes for, for 2018. You heard I it here first. Harold Frenzen. <laughs> Gosh, what's he up to now? I, I saw something. Yeah. <laughs> he actually won a couple of races, though, in the late 90s. That was always a, a bit of an yeah. interesting one. He, when he was William I guess and Jordan. And, yeah. The, uh, the one year Jordan was, like, good. Yeah. Yeah, the, <laughs> the one year that they were good. <laughs> there was, like, only one year where they were good. Like, what? It was at, Wait, like, 97, 98. I mean, it's, like, 20 years ago yeah, now, at least. it was, like, least. 90 or something. One, uh, there were big changes in cars, right? Yeah, and they've won in '97, and the year after, slicks were gone, and it was a uh, weird, uh, weird tires with like strips on them, and you had like oh yeah, uh, they had the, the grooves in them, yeah, 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 like weird regulation. And I remember Williams was uh, sponsored by Winfield, and it was like, what's mm-hmm. that damn cigarette brand? What's the weird or, or like red on Williams? It's supposed to be blue. What, what's going Actually- on? Actually, it's funny you should mention that, but I actually have a 1 to 18 scale model of Jacques Villeneuve in the Winfield sponsored uh, Williams up (laughs) on the uh, the shelf behind right where I'm sitting right now. Uh, I wish I had one of the 97, like the 97 Robins. If you're listening to the show and uh, send me an email and send me a a 1 8th replica of Jacques Villeneuve 1997 Robins car. I've got uh, I've got uh, a Lotus Forty Nine with a uh, Jim Clark. I've got uh, a Schumacher F Two Thousands. I've got the the aforementioned uh, Jacques Villeneuve Williams, and the other one I have is uh, a commemorative uh, Damon Hill nineteen ninety six World Championship. Um, well, that's the same uh, car. I'll take same, that car. Yeah, basically the same car. I mean, it's got the same livery on it and everything. I mean, of course, the the, the year after when 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 Jacques won, there was of course uh, some design uh, changes and whatnot, but. Uh, the the paint on the car is uh, pretty much identical to the year that uh, that Damon won it, and I mean, those colors the, the 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 dark blue, the white, the gold, and the red striping on it uh, it worked. That was a beautiful paint scheme for that car. To but I have day, to admit, if I could find a jacket of like nineteen ninety seven Rothman F Williams F one, that'd be cool. Like that would the, be a, the white yeah. and blue one with the gold stripe in the between. Like, I don't care if it's a cigarette brand, I would wear it probably. <laughs> if anyone has one, that's why I could probably find one on eBay. To like. Ten thousand dollars for it or something, but uh, yeah, I, I want to. I'll take a polo. Like I'll settle for a polo. But if you have a jacket, the same one Villeneuve was wearing when he came back on the plane in Montreal, when he won his championship, con, I want that jacket. Did they not have a big celebration that year at the old yeah, Montreal Forum? They filled the forum for him. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I mean, they 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 packed the place out when it was the Bell uh, Center uh, at that point. It was the brand new Bell Center in ninety seven. Was it the Bell Center? I couldn't remember yeah. if it was one it or the other. A, I know yeah, that it was, it was a packed house. Yeah, awesome. That that uh, That's going back a ways. But, uh, I mean, Jacques was very popular in the day, and uh, <laughs> I still love it. Blonde uh, hair, he's a, like, the blonde doing? hair, yeah, the frosted blonde hair. But, I mean, it's still nice to see him pop up every once in a while, you know, in, in the news, calling, like, guys like Lance Stroll, <laughs> the worst <laughs> war rookie in, <laughs> in, <laughs> in history. I've in the media with other, like, talking heads. Yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> that's just Jacques being Jacques. I, I wish and I could listen love to him. him. Like, I wish I had the audio track of him talk sometimes <laughs> now. It was a French TV, is it a French TV or something? Or I D V I don't know. I think it's a French sure. TV or something. I don't know. Yeah. No, uh, it was always good uh Can shock's plus, always yeah, good for a quote or two. Or something. Yeah. Cool, Kevin. Well, I think this is a, a great place to leave it. What's going on the network this week? Uh well soccer today we re- after a little break. Well, I was on vacation. So uh, <laughs> back from vacation, we started the show with a bang over the last few weeks. So you can follow Soccer Today every single day during the week, usually around 10 a.m. in the morning Eastern Time Live, or find the podcast version, on-demand version, anywhere you get your podcasts. Uh, same for this show here, Sports Podcasting Network, and sportspodcastingnetwork.com for uh, your browser or anywhere. So, uh, yeah. Very cool. And of course, you can follow this show on Twitter at Scuderia F1 Pod. And we also have a Facebook page, and that's facebook.com slash Scuderia F1 Pod. And that's it. That's a wrap. We look forward to catching up with you guys in about a week's time, and we'll sit down and recap the Singapore Grand Prix. Until that time, have a great F1, and we'll talk to you again soon. <laughs> 
Thanks for listening to the Skidaria F1 podcast. If you want to get the show notes for this episode, then head over to ScuderiaF1Pod.com. Want to get in touch with us? Then email us at ScuderiaF1Pod at gmail.com. You were listening to SPN, the Sports Podcasting Network. Visit us, sportspodcastingnetwork.com.